Hi everybody, my name is Pastor Dave Myers. I'm the lead pastor here at Royal Oak Victory Church. And thanks for joining in on the message today. My prayer is that it'll strengthen your faith, encourage your heart, and speak something powerful into your life. If it turns out to be a blessing, would you please consider sharing it with someone else as one of our passions here at ROVC is to get the word out to as many people as possible. And so without further ado, let's jump right into today's message. You know, it's so great to be able to be here, and I'm excited to be able to share with you and talk to you today. Um, before we start, I'd like to encourage you today to do whatever you can to engage in the message. Sometimes when we come to church a lot, we sometimes get into the kind of mindset of switching off a little bit and going, oh, you know what, I've heard this before. But I'd encourage you today. I believe God has something to say. And you can walk away today having met and experienced God. And I'm believing the same thing even for myself as I share this message. I am believing that God is going to speak to me so I can also walk away change. So I'd encourage you, really kind of um, bring your um, engagement to the message today. Uh, as Pastor Sheldon has mentioned, we, we're going back into our series today, Dinner with Jesus. We've been looking at the stories in the Bible of where Jesus had meal with others and what we can learn from these scriptures. So, I'll give you a little bit of a lowdown about me for those who don't know me. Most people are shocked when they hear this, but I actually have been on staff here for ten and a half years, which is a long time. In fact, some people don't even know I work here. <laughs> And they're always surprised when they're like, what, you work here? Yeah, I live here. <laughs> probably in the last 10 and a half years, I have probably been here longer than anyone else. During COVID, I never worked from home. Part of the reason is, is because my job title at that time, I did tech and I did media and I did worship, and all of that was important to make sure that church happened on a Sunday. So I'm involved in um, the worship area, in the media area, tech, like all of that stuff. I uh, keep myself busy, and so often on Sunday, if I'm not on stage, I'm usually running from here to here to back there. I'm trying to make sure that I do whatever I can to, to ensure that we all have church and we all experience it. Um, I have been in ministry since I was about 18, 19 years old, and I... Uh, was ordained back in 2006. And the reason I want to bring that up is because this is not my first time. It just has been a long time. <laughs> so you don't have to be like, oh, he's new. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Judge me like I've been doing this for 20 years. I want to say, you know, I love this church, but I also love like the church. The church is the bride of Christ. And you know what? The church is the hope of the world. And we need to have an expectancy that when we come to church, that we can experience God and he can do something in our lives. I believe that everyone needs to experience the life-changing power that comes from a relationship with Jesus. And that is what I'm believing. No matter where you are on your journey with God today, that you will indeed experience God in a fresh new way. Um, I am married to one wife. She's actually sitting back there with my parents just in front of the sound booth there. We have been married for 20 years. I celebrated my 20th anniversary. So what that means is she has been putting up with me for 20 whole years. I love her very much. We have a great life together. Um, so I love to be active. I love to play golf and I love to walk. If there's anything you need to know about me, I'm probably addicted to walking. It's, it, it is a disease for me. Um, I am often up, and by often I mean pretty much every day at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'm getting my 10,000 steps in before 7 o'clock. And I pretty much do that every single day. Um, part of the reason I do that is good for my brain, it's good for my body, keeps me active. But you know what? One of, the, one of the reasons I do it is because I get to enjoy what is known as guilt-free eating. <laughs> when you walk, like I walked 50,000 steps one day. Now, guess what? I can eat whatever I want <laughs> when I have walked 50,000 steps. And I did on that day. I have a special diet of two things, meat and potatoes. 
So I'm sure many of you have experienced one of those all-you-can-eat buffets, right? So you go there and you get your plate. Now, for some of us, maybe you haven't done the all-you-can-eat, but you've at least been in that buffet-style kind of experience where you've got your plate and now you kind of have to decide. I mean, I was at my mom's house yesterday. There's only eight of us, but there's like 30 options. <laughs> Who does that? Like, I'm not even joking. There's literally a buffet style for eight of us, and two of those are kids. <laughs> but, right, we've all been there, right? We've got the plate, and we come to the line, and we look, and we're like, what should I have? Hmm, well, I'm going to fill up with salad, or I'm going to fill up with potatoes, or I'm going to fill up with meat. Now, I'm the kind of person who believes you do not win friends with salad. You just don't. So, I don't even look at the salad. I'm the guy who's got a blank, like, there's nothing on my plate until I get to the meat and potatoes. Now, as I've got older, mainly to humor myself, but also to stop people making comments about my lack of salad, I'll put a tiny, tiny little bit of salad. In fact, if I'm in my mom's house, I have a separate bowl for my salad, and then I grab a different plate. But I'm always looking for the good stuff, which is the meat and potatoes. That is what I fill up on my plate. Now, if we all take a moment to think about what our buffet experience might be like, it's going to be different for each one of us. I'm guessing that it's probably nothing like mine. I like it, my food perfectly separated on the plate. It's not allowed to touch. I have potatoes here and I have meat here and... They just don't touch this, they're, they're separate. But for most people, they're not doing the same kind of thing. Your experience is going to be different. The reality is, though, we have to make a decision. Now, we are all in a place in our life where we're making decisions all the time. If I say to you right now, have you ever made a decision? Well, of course, the answer is yes. Even if this is the very first moment you have to make a decision, you've just chose today to make a decision. Either you agreed, yes, I make decisions, or you're like, I don't want to answer that. Well, that's still a decision. So the reality is that we all are in this place where we make decisions, and that is what I want to talk to you about today. So when thinking about what to speak about in regards to decisions, I was like, oh, I don't know exactly which direction I want to go. Maybe I want to just go, you know what, we need to learn to say no more. The problem with that is, some of us don't need to learn to say no more. Some of us need to actually say yes more. And so what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to just go, you know what, let's focus on, on one area and then kind of eliminate all the rest of the people. Surely I can talk about something that would include everyone. So the reality is, when we say yes to something, we are, saying, we are saying no to something else. And obviously vice versa. I may say yes to a plate full of salad, which would never happen. But what am I doing at that point in time? I'm saying no to a plate full of meat. If I've decided that I want to get out of debt, well, if I say yes to buying a $50,000 car on credit, I'm actually making the choice to say no to get out of debt. So if we focus just on a yes and no thing, we're, we're going to be thrown off right away because the reality is yes here means no here. No here means yes here. You know, the truth is when it comes to these decisions as well, there's many different reasons why we make the choices that we do. So some of us say yes because we feel pressure to say yes, or we, or we might like saying yes, or we've decided, you know what, it's the right decision, I need to say yes. But on the flip side, some of us say no, and the reason we say no is because maybe we're fearful. Maybe, like me, I have a problem. I just say no before I've even figured out what I'm being asked to do. It has got to me into trouble so many times. They'd be like, oh, Nick, can you do this? Nope. And I'm like, wait. Actually, yes, I want to do that. But again, some of us say no because we feel like it's the right thing to do. So decisions take on many different forms. Some are simple, like should I brush my teeth or should I eat breakfast? Others are should I say yes or no to this person who wants to hang out? Or maybe a life-altering decision that will forever change our future. No matter the decision, um, 
no matter the decision, they aren't going away. We always will need to make decisions. In fact, not making a decision in itself is a decision because time is moving. And because time is moving, that can be the reason we make a decision. Right? If you just wait and wait and wait and wait, sometimes that decision is already made, made for you. So as I had mentioned, rather than preaching about specific decisions to make, I want to talk about a portion of scripture that will help us learn how to make decisions. Essentially, it's more the input side of things before we have to make the decision, and that is what is most important. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to John 13, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. So before we read, the meal that we'll be looking at today is the Last Supper. In some ways, it's probably the ultimate meal, because it's the meal that takes place right before Jesus is going to be crucified. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of the Last Supper, they focus more on the actual meal, but I'll be reading from John's account because it touches on some things that I believe will help us make better decisions. It's not as much what happens as they are eating, but actually, we're gonna be looking at what takes place before they even start to eat. So, John 13, verse one. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands, head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash, except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. This is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that is what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as, I've, as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. So as we've read through this portion of scripture, what can we learn from what Jesus does when it comes to making decisions? So I believe there are three things that I can see, and the first is this. His decisions were guided by knowing who he was. I'll say that again. His decisions were guided by knowing who he was. We can see this in the first couple of verses. It says, it says Jesus knew that his hour had come. He had loved his disciples. Jesus knew that he was being asked to do what the Father had asked of him. He knew his authority. He knew where he had come from, and he knew where he was going. His eyes were wide open, and he was aware of what was to come. In John 5, 19, it says, So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. So Jesus was in connection with the Father, and he had a true picture and understanding of who he was and what his purpose was. You know, his eyes, like I had said, his eyes were wide open. We can only know what God thinks of us when we spend time with him. And this begins when we make the decision to say yes to Jesus. Our spirit, it comes alive. And we have the opportunity to understand and know who we are. We aren't going to be able to find who we truly are unless we go to the Father. You know, the world imitates things really, really well. But the reality is, it cannot replace what comes from what we can get when we spend time with the Father. Unfortunately, for many of us, we have areas in our life that we are viewing through filters and lenses that aren't from God. We are told what to think. We're told how to dress. We're told how to act. 
and what decisions to make. And you know, the truth is, some of these things are very well-meaning, but also on the flip side, they're also very unhealthy too. We aren't supposed to remove these things completely as we need others in our lives to see the big picture and the areas that we aren't always aware of. But the truth is the foundation to knowing that who we are has to be built on the foundation that is Jesus and what he thinks about us. And everything else becomes secondary. So when I wake up in the morning, right, I get out of bed, it's usually 4.30ish, and I stumble into my washroom and I look at myself in the mirror, what I see is not only determined by my physical eyes, but also kind of how I view myself on the inside. And I know that most of us look in the mirror at least once a day, and if you don't, let's go once a week. At least once a week, you look in a mirror at some point in time, right? So I can look in the mirror and I can be like, oh, you know what? Hey, on the outside, hmm, my hair is a mess. Or, man, I look good today. I mean, it's hard to believe at 4.30 you could look good, but sometimes it happens. Or, what the heck is hanging out of my nose? But we can also think, see things that go deeper than that, right? So maybe we look in the mirror and we're like, I don't know, I don't really like myself much today. Or you maybe feel sad, or maybe you feel really confident. That goes beyond just seeing on the outside. There's something more on the inside. So I can solve some of the outside problems, right? By, for example, putting on my glasses or putting them in my contact lenses. And then all of a sudden I look and I'm like, oh man, that thing hanging out of my nose, it's actually just my nose. <laughs> but you know what? We do that all the time. And so from the outside, we can solve that with some things. But what do we do kind of with the inside things? We, we have all of these things on the inside. Now, some of the things that I see or that I believe are there because of myself or because of others, right? Expectations, opinions, choices we've made or words that have been all spoken. All of these things become lenses and filters that we view life through. Now, I have a pair of pretty cool sunglasses here. Look at those things. Boom. Now, these glasses here represent, now you can't really see it because I made it really small. Why? I don't know, but I made them small. You've got fear, you've got success, you've got belief, expectations, thoughts, words, opinions, hurts. And this is what happens, right? When I get up in the morning and I look at myself in the mirror, this is what I'm seeing. I'm actually seeing these things. It's hard to actually remove these things because we've got filters and lenses that have been built up over time and that becomes our reality. So how do we begin to see ourselves in the way that God sees us? Well, when we say yes to Jesus, our spirit comes alive. I know I mentioned that before, but we have the opportunity to see exactly what God sees in us. And we do this by spending time with him and replacing old thoughts with new ones. The Bible is filled with scriptures that talk about who we are in Christ. You know, I have, a, I have sheets here. I have three sheets right here. This is a list of 100 things who I am in Christ. So the scriptures are full, full of new thoughts that I can grab a hold of. Most of us are not going to audibly hear God say, Nick, you are amazing. Well, you probably won't ever hear that. But I might hear that. But the reality is, is that sometimes I need to open up the word and I need to start reading the word. This is the kind of thing that happens. I replace those old thoughts with new ones. When I begin to allow these things to become part of my life, the decisions that I make begin to change because they are motivated by what comes out of my relationship with God. So the reality is, right, so we've got these glasses. How do, we, how do we replace? Well, you know, I have another pair of glasses. These are a little better. These are Jesus glasses. Now, I don't want to look too lame. I'm going to take these off. But these are the ones that I need to be wearing. These are the ones that I need to be viewing life through. So when I get up in the morning and I'm going, you know what, I don't feel the greatest today. Or maybe I'm struggling with, I don't know, whatever. This is the first thing that I need to do. Jesus. Boom. All of a sudden, what I see is Jesus. Now, I actually have Jesus on the inside, Jesus on the outside. 
So what happens is, when I see it, I see Jesus. When I look in the mirror, I see Jesus. When people look at me, they see Jesus. And this is the whole point right here. We're taking this. In many ways, this doesn't disappear. This is still here. But I'm putting this on after. I just whack myself in the face. <laughs> but this is what we need. This is the thing that we need to be doing every single day. And so I want you to do this. Every single time you look in a mirror, this is what you should be thinking. You should be thinking, man, those glasses that Nick was wearing are ugly. But I get it. When you're feeling down and when you're having a rough go and you don't know what to do, those 100 who I am in Christ scriptures, those are the things that come to mind. So when you look at yourself and go, hmm, I don't know, you put these on because you said yes to Jesus, that changes everything. That changes everything. If you're like, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know how I feel about myself. You don't know what I've done. Let me tell you this. God does. And when you say yes to Jesus, you have everything available to you that Jesus had. Now, I'm going to give you a personal example of how this has played out in my own life. When I was younger, I had this unique ability of being able to always do the wrong thing. <laughs> always. If I was supposed to do this, I would do this. If I was supposed to be quiet, I would not. If I was supposed to sit, I would not. It followed me. I did it all the time. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples of kind of how this played out, just to give you a little bit of idea of how much I got myself into trouble. So one time, I had a slingshot. And this slingshot, you could put an aeroplane on, and you would shoot it, and the aeroplane would fly. Well, one time I thought, you know what? I want to try and fire this rock over that car. Well, guess what happened? I didn't say I was smart. I said I did the wrong thing. Well, I fired that thing, and it went straight through the back window. Smash. Now being the kid and being always in trouble. I'm like, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. So you know what I did? I picked up my stuff, I ran, and left. Another story, we would ride down the hill, me and a friend, on our bikes, and when we would get to the bottom of the hill, we would jump off our bikes and see how far the bike could go by itself. Well, that was really cool until one time it did this perfect turn and scraped all the way down a neighbor's car. So I ran over there, grabbed my bike, hid. Guess what? I got caught and I got into trouble. Now, I no longer break windows or scratch cars, but you know what? The feeling I developed then of always doing something wrong or feeling like I don't fit the mold has followed me for most of my life and has impacted decisions and choices that I've made. If I feel like I'm being attacked or accused of something, I become defensive, and this impacts the decisions and choices that I make. This is something that I've had to work through. I've noticed that when I begin to look at myself and I'm feeling negative, it's because the lens that I'm looking through is based out of this feeling that I'm always doing something wrong. The truth, though, is that sometimes I do things wrong, but that doesn't make me wrong. I make mistakes, but I'm not a mistake. But that happens a lot. We can jump to the, oh man, I am the worst human on the planet. Well, that isn't what God says about me. That's, that's kind of what's going on on the inside there. This is why it's important for me to replace the thoughts with what God thinks of me. When I look at myself, what I should see is through these glasses right here, my Jesus glasses, and through the lens of what he thinks about me. This makes a tremendous difference when it comes to making decisions I make, because I'm no longer defensive, I'm no longer looking for a fight, but instead I'm reminding myself that I am forgiven, that I have a purpose, that I have hope, that I am secure. I can rest at this moment because my foundation is built on the correct thing. My focus changes and how I view the world around me and the people in it also changes. All the decisions that Jesus made came out of knowing who he was. And that is why it's so important for us to recognize and do the same thing. As we continue to look into this scripture, Jesus makes a decision to not 
do, uh, not only do this, oh, sorry, not to do, I'll start again. In fact, as we continue to look into the scripture, Jesus makes a decision to not do what would be expected of him. And that brings me to my second point, which is this. His decisions were guided by his commitment to serve. So Jesus is aware of who he is, and he had a decision to make. We are here at the last summer, supper. It's his, last, it's his final chance to be with his disciples before he will be crucified. He's aware of what's to come. Remember, his eyes are wide open. I think what Jesus chooses to do in this moment says so much about what we are called to do and what he is expecting us to do. In verse 4 of John 13, it says, So he got up from the table, he took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, he poured water into the basin, and then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. Jesus could have continued to stay seated, sharing more teachings with the disciples, but he does something so powerful and profound. He positions himself as a servant and begins to wash each and every disciple's feet. He didn't have to do this. There was no expect, expectation for him to do this. In fact, based on what the world is expecting at this point, only a servant would do this. Here he is showing us. He's not telling us. He's showing us what is most important. And this right here is actually going to be the thing that probably impacts our decisions more than anything else. Because it's out of that place of service that we can really... Uh, make different decisions. So with God, what is important is flipped upside down. Logic in many ways goes totally out the window with God, and it's not about following any worldly formula. Jesus teaches us to turn the other cheek or to go the extra mile. And the reason he does this is because he, he kind of like implores you. He wants you to be present in your choices. When you are asked to do something, like with the, Ro uh, the Roman centurion, you would have to walk one mile as a Jew. Not only walk one mile, but carry all of their armor. And then Jesus is saying, look, I want you to go one more, and the reason why I do is because I want you to be present in that decision. How many times in life do we do things, and we're like, how did I even get here? So when we think about decisions, we need to be present in those decisions. And looking at the life of Jesus, I think there's such a, an example in there. So out of my relationship with Jesus, I get an understanding of who I am in him. And what I do with that is to show people through service exactly what that is. What we are doing is never as important as how we are doing it. Let me say that again. What we are doing is never more important than how we are doing it. So that means regardless of the job you have, how you do that job is more important. When you're at school and you're like, oh, I don't know what I should do, how you do school, and by that I mean your attitude, the way that you treat the people around you, are you willing to go the extra mile? Are you willing to serve? That matters more. You know, the world's view of success is often it's a nice house or a happy family or lots of money or a nice car. But to God, success is something very different. In Galatians 5, to 23, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Success is actually living life, experiencing the fruits of the Spirit. And when you say yes to Jesus, remember, your spirit becomes alive. That's what happens. It comes alive. Now, fruit is supposed to be picked. That means when you're going through a difficult time and you have a decision, should I freak out or should I have patience? You have the ability because Christ is on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit is there. He is the comforter. He is bringing that. You have a decision. What are you going to pick? Now, as you keep doing that, it will get easier and easier to pick the right fruit. But I'd encourage you to understand and know that when you're in that place, again, it's kind of like this. You put your Jesus glasses on, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I get it. You're right. I can choose to have joy because you've picked it. Remember, like, fruit is supposed to be picked. I go to the grocery store oh, and pick apples. It takes forever because I'm trying to find the perfect apple. 
But that's kind of what it's like. I have a choice to pick the good fruit. This is the good fruit. Whether or not you have money or not, you know what you need more than anything? Patience and peace and love and joy and hope and the rest. Now, I spend quite a bit of time walking downtown and, uh, and over the years I've come into contact with quite a few homeless people who ask for money. And I remember one time I'm walking past this guy and I very, very clearly sensed that God was saying, Nick, you need to give that man your money. I don't know, I probably had $20 in my pocket. And so here I am walking past him going, well, hang on, if I give him the money, he'll spend it here. Or if I do this, then he'll do this. Or if I go, like, and so you kind of, I'm pretty sure we've all been in that place before. We've sensed that we should do something, and then we go through excuses. So I made all these excuses, and I'm walking along. I get the sense that God is like, look, Nick, this is not about him. This is about you, and it's about the condition of your heart. I want your heart to be open. So what I did is I turned around. I gave him the $20. I don't know what he's going to do with it. But to be honest, at that point in time, I made the choice to keep my heart open. And sometimes we need to make that same choice. So when I think of this experience in light of serving, it absolutely changes the decisions that I make. If I am asking myself, should I forgive someone? Well, when I remember what Jesus did for me and that he wants me to serve, others like he washed the disciples' feet, then the answer is yes. Maybe we are at work and we get to a place where we feel like we've made it. We're like, you know what, we're the boss. And we shouldn't have to do certain things anymore. Well, maybe we need to do it because it keeps our heart soft and maybe gives us an opportunity to share the love of Jesus to the people around us. Remember, with God, the world, it's like it's flipped upside down. It says the first will be last and the last shall be first. That is what it's about. And so when we're thinking about decisions, that is what we need to remember. Now, I'm going to go to my third point. Third point is this. His decisions were not swayed by what others thought. Now, just because of time, I'm only going to be sharing just one of the examples in here. Uh, we're going to be talking just about Peter. And so this is John 13, verse 6. It says, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, well, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Jesus, sorry, Simon Peter explained, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. So here, Jesus made a decision to get on his hands and knees and be a servant. And he's washing the disciples' feet. Well, Peter's like, it's kind of weird. Peter's looking at Jesus wash the disciples' feet. And he's like, oh, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet, are you? And Jesus is like, hello, yes, I am. And then Peter's like, well, no, you're basically, he's saying, you're too good for me to wash my feet. And then Jesus is like, well, no, you don't understand. I actually have to wash your feet. And so then Peter's like, well, okay, please wash all of me. Look, when we, um, when we make decisions dis kind of swayed and influenced by other people, we miss what we're supposed to do. If Jesus was like, you're right, Peter. I am great, so I shouldn't wash your feet. Jesus... Like, Peter would have missed out on so much at that point in time. Sometimes God has asked us to do something, and we need to do that. And you will get people coming around, and they'll be like, oh, you should do this, or you should do that. I don't know if you've ever been there. When, when you start to make decisions based on what everyone else wants, guess what happens? You go crazy. <laughs> you know... I'm thankful that in this, Jesus didn't listen to Peter because he was actually trying to get a point across. He was trying to say, look, Peter, if I wash your feet, you're cleansed. The same way when we say yes to Jesus, our spirit comes alive, and right then in that moment, you have everything you need from Jesus, everything. Sometimes we get into this kind of thinking where we're like, well, I need more of Jesus. No, you don't. You already have everything you need on the inside. What you need a little bit less of is the flesh. 
The flesh and the spirit, they're kind of at war with one another all the time. But the reality is, is that you have everything on the inside. Everything that Jesus had is available to you. And I'd encourage you to really focus on that and understand that. You know, when we look at decisions that we need to make in our life, let's remember that Jesus should be the first person that we go to when we are considering what to do. Every time that we look in the mirror, every single time, we should be remembering that we have these on. If we've said yes to Jesus, this is who you are. And like I said, for some of us, this may be a difficult thing to do because we've had a hard time. Maybe we have a hard time being okay with it, but we need to be okay with it because the world doesn't have a whole lot to offer us. People don't actually have a whole lot to offer us. They can help us, but often we go to people expecting them to give us answers when they have no clue how to live their own life. I think we've all been there. We go to someone, you're like, what should I do with this? And they're like, you should do this. And you're like, hang on, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I do that? And yet, this is what we need. This is the thing that we need to focus on. I want to tell you that no matter what you are going through, that no matter what decision that you have made. And although these decisions have consequences, both good and bad, God is aware of that and he's encouraging you to keep going. You don't have to stay in one place and accept that reality. You can open up your Bible and start to read who you are in Christ. I'd encourage each and every one of you, you should have at least, and this is at least, one scripture that you go to every single time. Mine is, this is the reminder, it's like I am forgiven. When I start to beat myself up, I am forgiven. When I'm wondering kind of like, oh, should I keep going? I am forgiven. It just does something on the inside of me. It brings life when I need it the most. Remember the spirit, when it is alive in you, when you say yes, you have everything you need, and that is the true riches. So this is what happens when we live life directed by God. It's that upside down living, and this is the gift that comes because of that. So I just encourage you all to stand in this place today. We're gonna to be closing right away. And I know that this is not directly related to like actual like specific decisions, but I believe this so strongly that this is the input needed to make better decisions. Sometimes we make decisions kind of like number one. And then everything else kind of falls in. We're like, oh man, if I don't make the right decision, I'm done for. Look, you are going to make the wrong decision. You are going to make the right decision. The actual decision doesn't matter. The problem is decisions, they become too final. Because once you've made one, you've just gonna make another one, and you're just gonna make another one, and you're just gonna make another one. But the reality is, I think if you focus more on that input side of things, and you're going to God, and you're getting a picture of who you are, all of a sudden it changes. Like I said, if you're wondering whether you should forgive someone, let me tell you, yes. You don't even have to think, like the reality is you don't have to think about it. And if you're in that place where you're like, I don't know if I can, the key is you go to God. The moment you get a picture of who you are in him, that changes everything. So before we close with prayer, I believe that as you take this message to heart, that your decisions will be made through the lens of being guided by who you are, your commitment to serve him, and to not being swayed by others, and not through the weight and expectations of the world. So there's two groups of people that I'm gonna pray for today. The first group I'd like to pray for is maybe for some of you in this place today, maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. And part of this too is I also wanna include people, maybe you need to recommit to Jesus. Maybe it's, uh, I 
I've been going the wrong way. I, I, I just need to turn back to him. And maybe it's that public declaration again that you need to do it. And so I want to kind of open it up. So if everyone, if you could bow your heads and close your eyes. If everyone, anyone in this place would like to accept Jesus today, I would encourage you to put up your hand in this place. You can put it up high if, because I can't always see it clearly from back here. So let's pray. God, I pray for each and every person in this place, God, that is seeking you. God, that recognizes today the need to say yes to you. God, whether it's for the first time or maybe it's just that public declaration to recommit to you. God, I pray that you would indeed meet them where they're at, that you would reveal, God, exactly who they are, Lord, as they spend time with you. God, you know their heart, you know, you know what they need. And I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. In Jesus' name, amen. And so if you did say yes today, I would encourage you, there is a card that's uh, in the seat pocket in front of you called the Fresh Start card. You know, the reason why we want to know that you've said yes is because being a Christian is actually not, you're not supposed to do it alone. We're supposed to do it as a team. This is actually the best decision that you can make. And so whether it's filling out the card or going to the guest center or coming to the front afterwards, it's important that you let us know. Now, the second group of people that I want to pray for today is really everyone else. You said yes to Jesus and your spirit is alive. Well, we're going to pray and we're going to believe that no matter where each and every one of you is right now, that your eyes would be open to what is on the inside of you and that you would remember the importance of this right here whenever you look in the mirror. So let's pray. God, thank you for each and every person here today. I thank you that when it comes to making decisions in life, that God, we don't have to do it alone. God, you know where each and every person is at in their walk with you and what decisions are going on in their lives. But I pray as they come to you and that you would reveal who they are in you, that God, out of that, they would be driven and guided by a commitment to serve, that they would know and not be thrown off by what other people say or think they should do. Let them remember each and every day the importance of having you as their foundation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everybody, thanks for watching the message today and I hope that it lifted and encouraged you in some way. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, we would love to know about it. And the best way to do that, to let us know, is by heading over to our website at rovc.ca and clicking on the tab that says connect with us. Also, if this message was a blessing to you, we'd love it if you could get the word out by liking and subscribing or even giving to our ministry. If you're interested in making a donation, you can do so by heading again to our website and clicking on the Give tab. Again, thanks for joining us, and may God richly bless you.